Hey everyone, this is Ryan from Athix Fitness, and you are listening to Season 2 of the Athix Approach Podcast, the podcast where we highlight inspirational vegan athletes and what they do to absolutely kill it on a plant-based diet. If you haven't already, it would really help out if you subscribed to, liked, commented, and or shared any of the content I'm producing, including this podcast, Athix Coaching Services, articles and training programs available on athixfitness.com, videos on YouTube, and more. Links for those will be in the description, and I truly appreciate everyone listening for all of the continued love and support. In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Manil Patel, a London-based vegan doctor specializing in general medicine with a passion for health and fitness. Manil has been vegan for over six years, has been lifting seriously for well over 10 years, and is a strong believer in keeping the mind and body healthy through nutrition, fitness, and science. We get into all the details about how and why Manil went vegan, his lifestyle and diet before and after, what drew him to the medical field, and his experiences in medical school and as a doctor. We also get into the nitty gritty details on plant-based protein sources and how they compare to animal-based proteins, meat and masculinity, and why men are less likely to go vegan than women, excelling in athletics on a plant-based diet, pressure on vegans to be good examples, and so much more. Manil is extremely knowledgeable, and I particularly loved hearing about his evidence-based approach to plant-based nutrition, his recommendations, and how he applies it to his own life. I think you'll get a lot of really interesting information from this episode in particular, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed our chat. If you're interested in connecting and following Manil on social media, he can be found mainly on Instagram at Dr. Iron Junkie. Thanks again to Dr. Manil, and without further ado, on with the show. All right, what's up, guys? This is Ryan uh, with the Athix Approach Podcast, and I am here with Manil Patel. Uh, Manil, thank you so much for coming on today, man, and taking the time to uh, join the podcast. No problem. Thanks for having me, Ryan. Yeah, of course. Um, so, Manil, you are uh, not only a doctor, but you are also vegan, right? Yes. <laughs> Nice. That's true. I tell um, everyone that. <laughs> <laughs> so how many years have you um, been vegan for, first of all? Um, so it'll be just over five years. Actually, we'll come up to six years this July. I actually remember the exact mm-hmm. date as well. Um, July 7th, okay. 2017. So it'll be six years. Oh, nice. Yeah. So you remember exactly where you were and everything when you went vegan. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Deb, we'll have to get into that in, too, in, a, in a, just a bit, but um, just for a little bit of an introduction about who you are and what you do and what you're all about, do you mind uh, just giving a few words about just a quick overview and we'll get into more details in a little bit? Yeah, sure. So you already mentioned I'm a doctor. So yeah, Dr. Minnell I'm actually from London, but I live in a uh, small county just outside West London now uh, called Buckinghamshire. Um, I work, so I've been a doctor for seven years. Um, and I'm currently working in general practice, so you guys call that um, family medicine over there. So that's what I'm kind of specialising in. Um, even though it's more of like a generalist specialty, it's still a kind of a specialty in itself. That's what I'm kind of working on at the moment. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I've been vegan for over five years. Um, obviously, I'm into lifting, uh, which is why I guess we kind of know each other or know of each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, I'm just kind of like promoting that kind of vegan lifestyle, promoting um staying fit and healthy promoting like lifestyle medicine to my, just not just my patients but trying to do that online as well mm-hmm. so you you've been vegan for six years and you've been, you've been practicing for seven years so you've mm. been vegan for most of your professional career it sounds like yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um how do you uh incorporate if at all do you incorporate any aspects of a plant-based diet or anything into your practice or is that kind of just like your personal you know what you do personally um so i guess the whole like being vegan is what i do personally um Mm -hmm. and i you know it's difficult because you get like maybe 10 15 minutes with patients i'm not going to be using that time to be talking about veganism uh, as much as i'd love to you know uh (laughs) you know if they if they mention it then it might be a good conversation like we get into it that's happened a few times where patients mention they're vegan or they mention they're vegetarian but usually it's um usually when they when we're talking about kind of nutrition if that comes up and usually does in some some diseases or some illnesses and I'll kind of mm-hmm. drop in in there, like, you know, if they, you know, if you eat a certain type of way, you know, eating more plants, eating less kind of animal protein. So kind of maybe not pushing it, but kind of mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. kind of broaching the topic, talking about plant-based diet and the benefits of it. That's how I kind of go about it with my practice. 
um, and that's how I say I would kind of talk about it rather than actually just going and talking about veganism itself um, yeah. you know because day to day you only get like 15 minutes per patient and stuff and really you're focusing mm-hmm. on the problem they've come in with uh, but I use kind of my voice online and kind of you know doing talks and things um, like veg fest and things like that to try and promote the health benefits of a plant-based diet mm-hmm. do you have any of your clients uh, that come to you specifically because they know you're a vegan uh, not yet, no. This because uh, <laughs> at the moment I'm still kind of training to be uh, a general pra- practitioner. So while I've been a doctor for seven years, I'm not like a consultant yet. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, when you have your own practice, I guess uh, you know, and if you do, especially private work, because here here in um, in the UK, it's it's mainly um, kind of government. It's like NHS, so it's socialized healthcare. Um, mm-hmm. You kind of patients just see you. They, they, most don't even know you because it's just so busy. You've got so many patients mm-hmm. and there's so many doctors, and it's they don't really kind of get the pick out or they won't know of me if, as such. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if you, um, you know, when you when you get to the kind of private space and market yourself that way, I guess people will seek, um, uh, seek you out. And I do get messages online every now and then from people um, who kind of want help or kind of want advice. Usually mm-hmm. it's on lifting more than more than health. But um, yeah. yeah, that's that's mainly how it goes rather than the patients themselves. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I'm not really familiar with... Uh really anything about like how even even here in the states how it works to kind of move up in the medical field as mm. a professional um could you kind of give like a, a quick overview maybe to anyone who doesn't understand like also me about sure. how you kind of move up through that field like you know starting with medical school and then maybe like uh you you practice it, it's like a junior practitioner is that the term and then you kind of yeah so up, like or? yeah so like here um so it's different from the USA because like, you guys over there do pre-med in college and then you go into medical school. Whereas here, mm-hmm. it's straight after high school, you can go to med school and it's like either a five-year or a six-year course. Um, and if you okay. have done a, a you know graduate degree, then you can condense down down to four years. So I did. Um, I went straight from high school into medical school. I did six mm-hmm. years because in that six years, I also did an, an extra degree in neuroscience. So I came mm-hmm. out of med school with two degrees and then you go into kind of two years of what we call foundation training, which is like residency um mm-hmm. okay. so you do those two years and that could be in you know you spend four months in different fields and then once you finish those two foundation years you then either choose to go into specialty training so that could be like you know a part of internal medicine part of general surgery um could be trauma orthopedics emergency medicine there's loads of all the different kind of specialities including mm-hmm. general practice if you want to do that um i didn't kind of go straight into it i kind of took some time and just worked in hospital in different specialties, kind of getting a feel of what I liked, um, mm-hmm. kind of doing a bit of um, locum work, which is like kind of um, kind of paid by the hour, which is which is is great <laughs> in a way because you can mm-hmm. save up some money um, whilst deciding what you want to do. Did a bit of traveling, and then I kind of kind of came around and decided actually uh, I want to do general practice. And general mm-hmm. practice itself is a three-year training course, so you you're like a um, we call it a registrar here. So once you've once you've done um, your foundation year, after that you're a specialty trainee doctor, uh, in, in and in general practice as a registrar. And then you've done three years. After that, you're a consultant. Once you've passed your exams and got all your competencies and things like that, that's how it kind of works here. Slightly okay. different in the US in terms of how long you spend at each level, but that's how kind of like you wake it work your way up. So you're kind of like a mm-hmm. foundation. You're then a junior, then a specialist registrar, and then a consultant, um, and okay. that's when you're practicing. Yeah. And how many years does that uh, generally take to move up to, you said consultant is the top sort of yeah. level? Yeah, so consultant consultant level is kind of where you want to be at. That's like you've completed okay. your training. Um, uh-huh. So if you're doing surgery, like if you're going to be a surgeon, you could spend like about nine years before you move up to that level um, mm-hmm. for things like different parts of internal medicine. It might be six to eight years for um, mm-hmm. general practices, three years. So it's not as long to move up, um, mm-hmm. but you learn quick because you're, you're literally in there. Um, and I guess you're not spending as long to move up because it's not so super specialized. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, you get better with experience as well. But three years is all they kind of give you. Okay. What made you um, want to do general practice specifically? Um, so, like, I like the variety of things. You see kind of, you'll be seeing different things every day. You're kind of, you know, one minute you're dealing with a baby. Next minute you're dealing with mm-hmm. someone at the end of their life. Um, you know, it's, it's that variety that's pretty good. Like every 15 minutes I'm seeing something different which kind of keeps your brain mm-hmm. ticking, keeps you thinking. And um, also ties in really well with things like lifestyle medicine. So 
you know, one of my passions is nutrition. Another passion is lifting and staying fit. Um, and I thought, mm-hmm. you know, how can I kind of combine those passions? And if I want to do something in the future related to those two, general practice seemed like a really good way in because, you know, you're you're dealing with people in the community. You're you're, you're able to make that difference before they get really sick. Um, you know, talk about preventative medicine. You know, if you if you can influence someone's the way someone's eating or exercising early on in life, then maybe that that will probably prevent them from getting sick down the line. Whereas, you know, right. when you're in hospital, you're seeing people that are really sick. You tend to see people that have already had the harmful effects of having a bad diet, bad lifestyle and stuff. Um, so you kind of yeah. get to them when it's too late. Um, also, being a, being in general practice here, you've got some more flexibility with your time. You can work maybe three days a week and then spend other times doing things that, um, you know, working on your passions. So working mm-hmm. for me, it'd be working on things like vegan activism or, or um, nutrition or fitness as well. So kind of gives you that flexibility that's why i was drawn to it really Mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense so it's a lot about trying to like you said almost like preventative as opposed to trying to fix someone's uh Mm. issues that they already have in terms of like working in the hospital Mm. surgery stuff like that i guess yeah yeah i mean i wanted to be a surgeon Um, before but i wanted i did want to be a surgeon before when i was at med school i think most people i remember when they asked uh how many people want to be a surgeon i think most of the the lecture hall raised their hands they said how many people want to be a general practitioner and then maybe 10 percent of that raised their hands and then the yeah. guy that was giving the talk said well funny enough after the six years it's going to be completely switched and the 10 percent that rose their <laughs> hands will go on to be surgeons and the rest will actually be general practitioners and that's literally how it is you get more people applying to be general practitioners because you realize that actually you want that flexibility with your life you want to be able to live mm-hmm. your life you don't want to be just dictated by spending hours and hours in hospital it's not mm-hmm. a hugely healthy way to live it's super stressful it's amazing and the work is rewarding, but it's not for everyone, I think. Why uh, are more people drawn to doing surgery over there? Is it Does it pay more? Is it uh, just more fulfilling to them or they think it would be more? It's. I think it's. this was the first year of medical school when there were asked. So people, people just yeah. kind of have the, people romanticize um, what surgery is really. And like it sounds mm-hmm. super cool, right? Like I'm a surgeon mm-hmm. and um, the status that comes with it. Uh, but it's a lot of hard work. Like these people are putting hours and hours in practicing in the theaters. You know, they're in the OR every day, uh, pretty much mm-hmm. on their days off as well. Like all the work that actually goes into it, people don't see that. And I think that it's it's just that kind of you have this um, you have this view of where you want to be and um, or where, who you want to be. But actually, when it comes to it, not everyone is cut out to do that. And I think. Mm-hmm. If I had done it, I think I would have had to sacrifice a lot more um, of st- other stuff I'm interested in just to do it. Um, okay. And I guess, I mean, it's not. This is just speaking for me personally. Other people can make it work. Of course, there's surgeons there that you know play professional rugby and all sorts of things. So there are people that make it work. I think just for me, I just didn't love it enough. And I think that's what it is. Mm-hmm. I think you really have to love what you're doing to be able to do it long term. Um, but a lot yeah. of people, you know, do end up thinking, yeah, I'll be a surgeon or I'll be a, you know, I'll be a neurosurgeon. It sounds really great, but when you actually come to the training and stuff, it's a lot more difficult than, it, than people think. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. So there's a big rumor. I don't know if it's a rumor necessarily, but it, it, I've heard it so many times here in the states, at least, that doctors, uh, especially for I guess general practice, don't get much nutrition uh, training at all through their medical school. Is that yeah. true? Is there any credibility to that, or is that kind of just a myth? No, that's true. <laughs> unfortunately, oh, wow. unfortunately, it's true. Um, the only nutrition training as doctors that we got at med school was a couple lectures when they were, um, I think it was when they were talking about either diabetes or um, heart disease. So how to prevent heart attacks or manage people that have had a heart attack. You know what dietary mm-hmm. tra- dietary changes they can make. Um, so it's about you know eating less saturated fats, uh, telling people to eat a more Mediterranean style uh, style eating pattern, um, mm-hmm. you know eating less salt. You know it's really basic advice, um, and uh-huh. the same with like diabetes and obesity. It's like oh yeah, eating less calories and uh, eating less sugary foods and processed foods. It's kind of basic stuff. Like you know mm-hmm. if you if you asked anyone on the street what's a healthy diet, they could probably tell you. <laughs> They could tell you roughly that a Mediterranean diet is probably a slightly healthy way of eating. You you shake your head, but it's it's probably like you know safe bet that most people know that fruit. Most people know that fruits and vegetables are good for you. Of course, there's a growing crowd out there now that think fruits and vegetables are trying to kill us. We'll talk about that at some know, point as crazy. well. I'm sure, but um, the average person knows that you know you know if I talk to my patients, they know they should be eating more fruits and vegetables, and they should be eating mm-hmm, less mm-hmm. you know sugary foods and stuff. So um, but that's the kind of basic basic dietary 
you know teaching we got at university which is which is terrible because you know as doctors we should know what foods um we should be telling our patients to eat really um and i think it's just not taught well because i don't think it's because we're all trying to give our patients medication it's not that i think it's just mm -hmm. something that modern medicine hasn't considered as being so important when we know it obviously is but i think things are changing now and uh, there is there's a growing movement to introduce things like culinary medicine into universities um, and nutrition into universities. So there is a movement there now. Yeah, uh, I do get a little bit of the impression that it is kind of circling towards getting a little more towards the pre preventative side from like someone mm. who doesn't really, you know, who isn't involved in that space at all. I just do see more, more, more and more people talking about diet and uh, kind of it's almost like a little bit anti even anti-pharmaceutical to an extent. You know how there's like mm. a movement for that almost? Um, mm. So that's uh, interesting that you say that because, yeah, I guess a lot of doctors are known to kind of, you know, throw out prescriptions and such. Mm. Um, but uh, it is nice to be like, okay, here's here's a pharmaceutical that, you know, here's a medicine that can help you. Uh, also, adjust these aspects of your life and, you know, treat the, the root cause. Is that kind of what your belief is um, or... Do you have yeah, a different that's, belief? No, that's pretty much how I try to practice. I say, you know, it's like, we'll take an example of like cholesterol. Like I get someone with raised cholesterol mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, but I eat healthy. And then I'll actually ask them like, well, what do you eat? Because clearly it's raised. There's, there's reasons for that. You know, usually it's because they're carrying a bit of extra weight around the midsection, uh, which we know can is associated with increased cholesterol. We, you know, the, I ask them what they eat and usually they say stuff like they eat butter, coconut oil, um, they, they eat a lot of processed red meats or red meat, you know, things like this we know can raise cholesterol, um, excess calories. But they, they, do they think it's healthy? Yeah, they do. They do. Like, yeah. they think, you know, I had someone saying, oh, I eat healthy. And I go, well, what do you eat? And she goes, well, I eat this, like, eggs, okay? I mean, mm -hmm. one egg mm -hmm. a day may not kill you, but having multiple eggs every single day is going to add up, you know, and especially if you've yeah. already got raised cholesterol. And then I had one lady who was eating like half a stick of butter because she liked the taste, but she was, so she was eating lots of vegetables, but she was covering it in butter. So it was just completely yeah, yeah. Uh, negating the whole, um, you know, health aspect of the vegetables. Um, so yeah, I kind of broached what they could make changes in their diet, um, exercise as well. We talked about how much they're exercising already and how they could increase that as well. And that will help also mm -hmm. help them not just lose a bit of weight, but it will help their heart health as well. Um, mm -hmm. But then I also tell them, you know, this is your risk. We've calculated it using all these values. Your risk is this much. According to this, we should be giving you a statin to reduce mm -hmm. your cholesterol. And then they say, oh, you know, statins have those side effects and they're terrible. Blah, blah, blah. And I know, and I just say, look, I understand they do have side effects, but actually they are one drug that's been proven to reduce your risk of having a heart attack and a stroke. We know that from all mm -hmm. the data, like everything we practice is evidence-based and I try to stick to that evidence. Um, so, you know, I try to do both and it, it, people kind of do want an easy fix as well, which is sad. Um, you know, get some people that are like happy to try the diet out and then we can retest in three months time and things. But a lot of people do want that easy fix um, and it's hard mm -hmm. to make the changes that are necessary to actually transform, transform their lives. Um, so whilst they blame doctors for, you know, pushing pharmaceuticals, we just know that that tends to be what most people end up needing mm -hmm. or end up having because making lifestyle changes are hard you know it takes it takes mm -hmm. a lot to change your habits um so yeah i mean i'm still going to be pushing to do both so pushing the lifestyle changes as well as advocating for safe um, pharmaceutical things when, when necessary mm -hmm. yeah. so does that kind of uh tie in with where you think people go wrong with nutrition sometimes like do you think it's almost like uh what's the term like um they're looking for good news about their bad habits. Basically, they don't want to believe that adding, you know, a lot of butter to something is unhealthy. Or do you think it's more mm. like they really just don't understand? I think it's a bit of both. Um, I think it's. I think nutrition is. It's hard to understand um, mm -hmm. when you're not really deep into it. Um, and even myself, like I'm still learning so many. I'm I'm still learning so much, and I'm sure. you know, I've been a doctor for seven years, and I'm still having trouble getting my head around it completely because mm -hmm. it's it's a, it's a lot more complicated and i think it's then complicated further by how like the media will push a story and how butter is back and it's good for you and then one second it's oh no butter is terrible it's bad for you and the eggs are bad for you but then eggs are good for you and then it's just confusing people so i think the public are generally quite confused as to what mm -hmm. to eat in a way i mean i did say that they tend to know what is healthy and what's not i think there is confusion there as well um 
you know, we know that Mediterranean diets are, tend to be healthier, but then I think people just mm-hmm. kind of say that, but then they won't practice that. They won't, they will just eat it some days and some days they won't. There's a bit of ignorance there. People, and I think, as you know, what you said about kind of people um, wanting to eat the way, you know, or hearing news about the way they're eating being good and then kind of holding up those mm-hmm. beliefs that, that cognitive bias is what, what you're kind of alluding to. Um, you know, if you tell someone that eating meat is good for you um, and they, liked eating, they like eating meat, then that's going to push them further into eating that way. Um, yeah. So there is that aspect of it as well that we're having to deal with where you're kind of having to tell people actually, no, it's not good for you. Um, and you're trying to kind of weed out the misinformation that's kind of rampant everywhere right now, especially in social media. Oh my god, yeah, it's it's pretty bad on social media right now. Well, it's I guess horrible. it's kind of just comes to the territory of social media. Um, yeah. But that's uh, that's a whole other subject there. Uh, in terms of, um, yeah, it, it's like you you mentioned a good point there. It's like yeah, we all a lot most of us like the taste of meat. You know, like even as mm. vegans, we liked the taste of meat. It's not like we were like, hey, you know, we want to give this up because it tastes terrible. Like, mm, exactly. it's just we realized that um, it wasn't the right thing to do morally for for a lot of us, a lot of us for health reasons to an extent. But still, it's it's not like we we want to give up something that tastes good to us. It's uh, some people might disagree a little bit here. Maybe they just really don't like the taste of it. But I, I do yeah. find most people do like it. And uh, we just kind yeah. of were like, OK, you know, this we think about it logically and we're like, all right, let's toss this aside and just try to move on with just eating, uh, you know, the substitutes and such. Um, did you get into veganism first of all, as more of a moral thing or uh, was it nutritional purposes? For me, it was purely moral, purely moral. Um, so like I was a big meat eater, like, um, I guess if, you know, if the carnivore diet was around when I was, um, you know, starting med school, I think I would have been a carnival diet uh, zealot because mm. I was because I was doing paleo back then. Like I was like, yeah, eat like a mm. caveman, lots of meat, vegetables. I was eating vegetables though because I wasn't. I didn't think they were trying to kill me, so I was having vegetables, but I was eating lots of meat, and I was having like all sorts of wild meats and everything. So, if you if you had said to me then that you're gonna go vegan uh, at some point in your life, I would have laughed in mm-hmm. your face. Like I was the last person out of all my friends that or out of anybody I knew. Who was ever going to mm. go vegan um but i loved animals you know i always said mm-hmm. i loved animals um you know i had this you know if there was an animal in the room like a dog in a room i'd be straight at it um you know i, I was obsessed with them i probably would have been a vet if i wasn't a it wasn't in <laughs> didn't become a doctor um but yeah no for me i, I came around to veganism purely from the moral point of view um mm-hmm. i just had like enough discussions with people online and you know it was i, I just i didn't have a i didn't have an argument like my mm-hmm. argument was that it tastes good, um, which is not good enough, uh, especially when mm-hmm. you're thinking about it morally. And the other argument I kept using was, uh, I think I, I mentioned the, the protein argument was there, but then that got kicked out when I saw vegan bodybuilders. So I was like, okay, there's, yeah. they're, clearly they're getting protein. Okay, um, what else can I say? Uh, um, ah, food chain, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, it's part of the food chain, but it's not. Like, we're we're killing 80 billion animals a year um to feed just to feed us and we're still starving like what what is the natural part of that what part of the food chain is that we're destroying mm-hmm. Amaz- the amazon we're destroying uh, the environment um how is this part of the food chain like none of these things made sense to me so mm-hmm. you know i yeah it was july 7 2017 um i got sent a video um which was a i don't know if you've seen it this is the greatest speech you'll ever hear by gary urofsky yeah 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 i watched that, that was uh, I, that was his ted talk was it no, it was it was at he was went to just... some he was at some college or some or some um high school. Uh I think he might have been a college yeah. actually. And he just gave a lecture there. Um Did you get like that ran... from sorry, where did where did yeah. you hear about uh that speech in the first place? Because um, I heard about it from Vegan Gaines. Remember that dude? <laughs> yeah, I remember that dude. <laughs> no, so like <laughs> at the time I was actually um dating a vegan, but I wasn't okay. vegan. Right? I was dating a vegan, I wasn't vegan, and she was she seemed cool about like okay with the fact that i wasn't vegan she never like pushed me she wasn't like the kind of person that would be like oh you should go vegan you should go vegan never never did she say you should do this ever it Mm -hmm. was more it was really clever actually she would just kind of ask me questions like probe you know and also introduce me to vegan foods like oh let's go here why don't you try this burger like why don't you try this and back then there wasn't as many alternatives as they are now beyond meat didn't exist impossible foods didn't Mm -hmm. exist it was it was before that um, you know, like, why don't you try this? And I was like, okay, this is pretty good, isn't it? And then one day it was like, she took me to an animal sanctuary. That was 
one crazy thing she did she took me to the animal sanctuary mm-hmm. while i was still eating meat and i said yeah let's go because i love animals so i want to mm-hmm. see these animals and i went there and i'm speaking to the guy and i'm like looking at all these animals i'm like shit these guys are, these animals will be rescued from people like me like they were going to be slaughtered for food and other reasons by people like me like i'm paying for that mm-hmm. if i'm because i mean me right and that really hit me hard i was like damn like i am I really going to carry on doing this after I've seen these animals? Like, there were so many, like, ducks, chickens, uh, cow, cows, uh, donkeys, horses. It was just a huge, like, sanctuary. It's amazing in Denmark. And then I came back home, and then a few days later, she sent me the video by Gary Ofsky, and it was on YouTube, and I watched it, and I was just like, mm-hmm. crap. Like, I, that's it. I broke down. I was like, I cannot go, I can't carry on doing what I'm doing after seeing this. So, yeah, yeah. pretty much a vegan overnight for, as you said, moral moral reasons rather than health. Mm-hmm. There's a lot to uh, unpack there. Uh, mm-hmm. I guess my first question is, um, you know how a lot of people could be could be in your shoes there, where like they mm. they end up at an animal sanctuary or something. Like I've taken some of my friends to an animal sanctuary before who are omnivores, mm. Mm. and they go there, and it's like they realize that yeah, they're those are animals that would have been killed for meat for food for people, mm. um, and they still don't go vegan. Mm. Uh, why do you think some people are so do you think it's a disconnect there or do you think mm. it's they're really just uh they like leave and all of a sudden they forget why do you think people can see this and then just mm. move on with their life you know yeah i mean you literally described the meat paradox isn't it like how can people love animals and then still eat them and that's mm-hmm. that's been around for years and years and years that, that paradox that we live with um and i guess to kind of almost uh you kind of keep that locked away somewhere and you have this cognitive mm-hmm. dissonance uh, that is created every time you have to think about it. So when you took these people to the um, to the sanctuary, they were faced with that dilemma for a, for a short while. Like in their mind, it was, you could, you could probably, they could probably feel the tension, the stress or the fact that, mm-hmm. you know, these, I'm, I'm responsible for the deaths of these animals, isn't that? But then as soon as they leave, unless they keep thinking about it and unless that thought then leads to the possibility of them going vegan, they won't do it right and it's that getting to that next step of actually can i go vegan you know can this be a way of living and i think that's such a step for people to make because it's the unknown like you don't know like what you'll have to do you don't you know what you're giving up you know you're giving up like how you're living now the habits you'll mm-hmm. have and and things that is comfortable for you. you you enjoy eating chicken wings and you enjoy like um having a burger with, with your friends at a barbecue and all this stuff not doing that anymore what are you replacing that with and it's that, it's that fear of the unknown that people tend not to want to, as human beings, we tend not to want to step into that unknown. It's uncomfortable. Yep. Um, and that's why I think a lot of people don't make that extra step. Whereas you and I, at some point in our lives, we were also faced with that decision, right? But we mm-hmm. decided to make that step into the unknown because the motivation was strong enough for us. Like we, we felt, yep. I don't know, maybe we felt something more for the animals. Maybe our will, um, our will to kind of do the right thing was stronger. Um, I'm not saying that people that, you know, eat animals are horrible, bad people. Um, you know, right. the everyday normal people, my family consume animal products and mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah, I love them to bits, right? But they, for them, it's just probably not an important enough issue to try and even take them to that place of discomfort um, because they don't know, you know, firstly, they know about this stuff maybe a little bit, you know, the, the reasons for doing it. Um, mm-hmm. But it's not, maybe they don't know enough firstly to make them push them that way or they're so scared of this part of the unknown um Mm -hmm. that they don't want to that they that they can't make that extra step that's all it is really that's what i think anyway i think you summed that up perfectly and i think that can also be related back to what we talked about earlier about the nutrition aspects where it's like everyone's looking for good news about their bad habits and uh you know people are always circling around for more and more excuses to not go vegan and i i get it like i said earlier it's like it's not like it's easy to change your lifestyle it's not like we all want to cut out things that we're used to and things that taste Mm. good to us um so yeah it's complicated there and it's it's a lot of like uh, i think a lot of people try to dodge it by saying things like what you kind of said earlier about our previous reasons for not going vegan like um food chain uh you know taste buds bacon though you know shit like that yeah yeah um so i get it like it's a lot of people i think a lot of people understand that it's not the the ethical thing to do but because it's so hard to make that lifestyle change culturally it's so normalized um they want yeah. to keep throwing out these excuses uh and then they validate validate their decisions by these 
excuses that I think a lot of times they know don't really have ground to stand on. Mm. And the, they just want to not really think about it because if they think about it too much, it's like this moral dilemma where they know that they should go vegan, but they just, it's a, you know, it's a vicious circle at that point. Yeah. I think a lot of them do believe in the kind of justifications they give to an extent as well. Like, you know, mm-hmm. people give the argument about health a lot of these days I see is it's not, you know, vegan is sure. not healthy. You have to rely on supplements and all that kind of stuff. And then that says, that makes them think that eating the current way they're eating is healthy. You know, mm-hmm. how healthy are people eating these days anyway? Like the average American, the <laughs> average Western or UK diet oh, isn't so a healthy much. diet anyway. So if health is their real concern. So that's just something they will say mm-hmm. to, and you know, um, but you know, I was there too, right? There was a point in my life where people talked to me about vegetarianism and I didn't want to hear it, you know? I would, and I would actively avoid watching things that might make me go vegan. I would not watch slaughterhouse footage. I would make sure mm-hmm. that that did not come up into my feed ever. I would make sure that I didn't watch things like Cowspiracy, like on Netflix. I just did not want to watch that. That was out for a few years before I went vegan that came out. But I just didn't want to watch mm-hmm. it because I was like, if I watch it, I know that I'm a rational person. So if I watch this, it's going to make me change. And I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to make that change, I guess. Yeah. So when you did make the change, you were already lifting for a bit at that point, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. About yeah. Uh, five years, I think. Four years, yeah. Beforehand, beforehand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you even described yourself, you were like a diehard uh, meathead, both, mm. uh, I guess, in diet and uh, mentality with lifting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So how would you describe the process of, um, you know, switching your diet during that time in terms of uh, um, lifting performance also? Were you worried about losing progress in the gym, losing muscle, things like that? Mm. Yeah, that's. I think that was my biggest concern, actually. That was So, you know, when I was, da- as I said, when I was dating... Um, um, a vegan at the time um, mm-hmm. we're broken up now but when we were dating I, I would say to her like you know I, I, look this is great but I couldn't do it I can't go vegan because I, mm-hmm. you know, I need protein and protein only comes from uh, meat so you know yeah. sorry <laughs> I, can't, I can't lose these gains like, what's, the, what's the point of going to gym if I can't if, I, if I'm not going to build muscle right all these things <laughs> like it was going through my head right um, obviously completely false um, mm-hmm. but you know it's a very real um it's a very it's a reality for a lot of people they worry about that and i worried about it a lot um at the time and i even sat down with one of my friends who's a nutritionist um and he he went vegan as well and i asked him i said look like you know tell me like can i actually make because because he's he's in good pretty good shape and i said can i continue to make the same gains if i'm vegan and at the time he said yeah, you'd just have to plan your diet a bit more. Like, you just have to plan the diet well. Like, just how you're planning it now and looking at your macros and things. You need to do the same Mm -hmm. thing, but get it from the plants. And I was like, yeah, but can I do it? Can I get enough? He goes, yeah, of course you can. Like, look at all these other examples. And he gave me the examples. And obviously, he was a nutritionist as well. Um, Mm -hmm. And and then he said something interesting to me, which was, even if you can't, like, even if you can't make the same gains, so what? Like, is Mm -hmm. that more, what's, what's more important to you? Is it being able to make gains and, and you know get stronger and or are you happy with making slower progress in the gym if, if, if that's what if that's what happens but at the same time you're doing something that you morally believe is right that you believe it's right to you know not harm these animals anymore and I said shit that's that's a good point like for me personally uh, it was better to do the right thing than um, worry as much about whether or not I would make the gains um, mm-hmm. because it's really, you know, whether I put on, you know, an extra pound of muscle here and there, or whether I lift, you know, for a couple of pounds more, um, in the grand scheme of things, do, do thousands of animals need to die for me to be able to do that? No. Yeah. Right. So that, that made complete sense. And that, that kind of completely got rid of all my fears about it. Um, I still went on and researched kind of what to eat and looked at, you know, looked at, um, there's lots of YouTubers that were like sharing their recipes, um, I don't know if you like you know uh, Simnet Nutrition, Derek Simnet. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. He was one of the early ones I looked at and like kind of looked at his videos. Nimai was another one I yeah. looked at more for kind of inspiration, I guess. But yeah, yeah I was F Vegan Gains, another one you mentioned. I was like, those of these guys are doing it. Like it's it's yeah. it's not impossible. So I think yeah, once I kind of tweaked my diet, made the changes I need to make, it just carried on. Like it didn't. I didn't have a dip. I didn't feel like mm-hmm. I got any weaker when I went vegan. When I transitioned, I was actually eating a lot more calories. So I actually got stronger. Um, mm-hmm. And I can t- continue to build muscle, so it, w- it worked out just fine. Um, but I thought yeah. that was an interesting conversation with, that I had with him about the mor- moral morality aspect of it. 
Yeah, and I think yeah. that's a great point too. And uh, luckily, I mean, as you you know, it's like we can have all of it. We can uh, mm. be ethical. We can make the ethical decision, and we can still make amazing progress. I would say, just the same. There's yeah. there's no difference. I'm I'm sure you would probably say the same thing, right? Yeah. There's. I mean, provided you eat enough. There's no difference, provided you train hard yeah. enough. There's no difference. Like there's no special, yeah. there's no special compound in meat that you can't that you can't get from plants apart from creatine, which we know you supplement anyway. Like you're not supposed to. Everyone supplements with it. You're supposed <laughs> to supplement. All the all the studies are done on supplements. None of the studies are done on oh this person right. ate this much meat and therefore they got five grams of creatine. Everything's done with supplements with with creatine. Mm-hmm. So that's the only one really. There are other ones that you know like choline and stuff that you need to be aware of, but you can get mm-hmm. them from plants provided you eat the right mm-hmm. right foods. So. Yeah, or, or if you like, you like the body synthesizes choline anyways. Just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, feed feed yourself the right stuff. And if you're really worried about something like choline for like brain function or something, just take like an alpha GPC supplement or like yeah. see the choline or something. But like, I've never seen any studies showing that uh, co- mental like you know cognition is worse in uh, vegans. I don't no. I don't even know if that was ever conducted. But there was one that, the one that showed it was better. <laughs> If anything, oh, yeah. they, they sh- it was one study that showed that it was better. But again, it's one study. Oh. Like I, I don't go off just single yeah, yeah. studies, but the fact that a study showed that vegans and vegetarians actually had better cognition, you know, mm-hmm. blows that completely out of the water, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. that's that's a great point. Um, yeah, there's there's all these studies popping up now showing that uh, animal protein um, and uh, plant protein are really equivalent as long as you, uh, you know, you you try to match the amino acids there, which mm. really isn't that hard. And I think. I, this is something I'd be interested to talk about with you. Um, the whole myth of the uh, protein combining slash incomplete protein stuff with, uh, you mm-hmm. know, plant proteins because, yeah, like plant proteins, they have a varying degree of amino acids, just like every other, um, you know, source of protein. There's different amounts of e- amino acids, but plants get a really bad rep because maybe certain things like rice and beans are mm. low in specific amino acids. But as long as you're eating that varied diet, you're getting enough of everything, right? Um, yeah. What is your opinion on, uh, you know, the whole animal protein versus plant protein debate there? Yeah, this is really interesting because you said animal and plant proteins are uh, are equivalent. They're not uh, in, in in many ways. Um, mm. So it's interesting because the reason people say animal protein is better is because um, they have all the essential amino acids in the right amounts for you not to get deficient, right? So if you're eating a, a, a low protein diet uh, or the minimum amount of protein you need per day, then you know you need to you you might need to worry about whether or not you're going to get all the essential amino acids, right? So if you're you know in a country where food is scarce, um, and a lot of mm-hmm. this all a lot of these studies have been done to prevent deficiency, right? So a lot of the studies on essential amino acid requirements have been done to prevent deficiency. Um, mm-hmm. So of course on that grounds having um, the lowest t- amount of animal protein would be better than having the lowest amount of plant proteins because you'll get all the essential amino acids. Sure. We're not living sure. in that sort of environment. And if you're trying to build muscle, you're not going to be eating the lower ends of protein. So you're going to be eating mm-hmm. more plant protein. As soon as you increase that protein intake to like the 1.6 grams per kilogram that we, we kind of tend to look at for muscle building, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. argument of um, needing meat to get all the essential amino acids goes out the window. Um, the other thing is, so plants do have all the essential amino acids, but as you said, in varying amounts. So provided you're eating different sources of plant proteins throughout the day, uh, mm-hmm. not necessarily at the same meal. So the whole combining things with rice and beans at the same meal, whilst it's actually, it's a good idea because you're going to get a varying source of protein. You don't have to do it. Mm-hmm. We know that provided you do it within a 24 hour period. So, you know, whatever you have, have at breakfast, lunch and dinner, um, provided they are all varying sources of protein, you're not just sticking to one source you'll get all the mm-hmm. essential amino acids you need. So the body's smart. It knows how to get the right amino acids uh, as long as you eat a variety of protein, type, protein types. Um, whereas, you know, with meat, you're going to get all of them at each at each meal because it's flesh, isn't it? It's, it's the same, it's same as mm-hmm. our tissues itself, right? Um, so that really doesn't matter provided you eat enough protein. The other thing is um, absorbability. So people get worried that you might not absorb all the protein. So what you know, if you eat protein from plants, great. You're not going to absorb it because it's bound up in plant structure. Mm-hmm. Again, there's, there's like a half, there's half truth to that. Like, yeah, like you'll need to, you know, to digest plants. You have to cook it, um, and 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 chew it well, and then you will absorb the protein. You know, it's provided mm-hmm. you cook it. Uh, a lot of the studies that looked at the differences were done using kind of raw ingredients, and they've been done in pigs as well rather than humans. So the data mm-hmm. is just not the same. 
Um, and what we care more about is like the human outcome data. So what actually happens when you compare uh, plant protein and uh, animal protein in a study. So like we had one such study done a couple of years ago in Brazil where they had habitual vegans. So they were vegans already um, and they got some omnivores as well. And they put them through kind of an exercise routine to a muscle building regimen for like 12 weeks, I think it was. And then compared mm -hmm. the muscle before and after. They just, all they did was they matched the protein. So the vegans were getting 1.6 grams per kilo and they got a soy, soy based supplement to, to bump it up to that. The, um, the omnivores got whey and at the end they measured and there was no statistical difference between the muscle gains there. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if it was going to be such an issue that you weren't absorbing the plant proteins and all this other stuff, then they, there should have been a difference at the end, right? Because you obviously mm -hmm. weren't get, getting, the, getting the protein. That's just one study, but there have been other ones like that. You know, and, and we know just from our own experience, whilst we've been lifting, we're not, we're not suffering, we're not, we're not going deficient. So I think people mm -hmm. don't need to worry about that. But the reason I say animal and plant proteins aren't equal, uh, not just because of the reason I just gave, but... Mm -hmm. um, We've, we've, we know studies that show that um, when we eat more plant proteins, so there was a big study that was done, again, in big methodologies in 2020, we looked at, I think, 400,000 people. The more plant protein people ate, the less kind of uh, negative health outcomes they had from like cardiovascular disease and cancer. Whereas the more animal protein people ate, the worse outcomes they had with cardiovascular disease and cancer. So mm. actually, plant protein is better. Because not only can you make gains the way we want to, uh, not only is it more environmentally friendly, but it's better mm -hmm. for your health. So it's a win-win in th three different situations right there. Damn, uh, that was, uh, you, you knocked it out of the park with that explanation, dude. Um, I have so many things uh, to, to kind of unpack there and elaborate on. But um, I guess my first question is, just based on what you just said, um, the plant protein being healthier for you in terms of things like reducing chance of like mm. heart disease and such, is that, was that shown to be specific? I mean, you can't, I guess you can't really study it to this extent because you're going to get a certain amount of fiber with, with the plant yeah, protein you get, right? Yeah. Is yeah. That... It's not specific to the protein itself. It's more about the package that it comes in. So the overall the package, package that okay. yeah, exactly. So we, you don't, I think it's, it's, it's remiss of people to look at protein from such a, like a narrow approach, kind of like. Mm -hmm. just looking at meat for the protein you look at the package it comes in like we don't look at lentils just for the protein we look at the package mm -hmm. that is so obviously the fiber the um, extra vitamins and minerals that come in it as well you know um and and when you're looking at meat what are the, what else is it coming with what well, it's coming with saturated fat it's coming with kind of um these compounds that when they're burnt and cooked at a high uh, degree you release things called heterocyclic amines um mm -hmm you know, increases levels of TMAO as well. Like all these things have negative mm. effects in the body, uh, either at the colon itself by causing increased rates of colon cancer or by um, having um, an effect at the endothelial cell level. So your blood vessels, we know it causes a bit mm -hmm. of inflammation there, which can make them stiff, increase your risk of high blood pressure, increase your risk of, uh, um, risk of heart attacks and strokes. And I've already mentioned mm -hmm. saturated fat, which can raise your LDL cholesterol and APOB, which again will then lead to heart attacks and strokes. So, you look mm -hmm. at the package that it comes in, you know, we know lentils and stuff doesn't really raise your LDL cholesterol. In fact, in fact it actually can mm -hmm. lower it because of the fiber and stuff. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's more looking at it from a holistic picture rather than just focusing on, I need protein for my gains. Meat has protein, therefore I eat meat. No. Uh, what about your heart? What about your brain? What about, you know, your long longevity? Do you, do you want to live to the age of 60 or not? You know, we want to we wanna thrive. We don't want to just gain, make the gains at the age of like 30, 40 and have a heart attack. You know? <laughs> Yeah. Damn, dude. Um, yeah, I love that. You, that's a great point. You have to look at the whole package for the protein. Mm. Like you can't completely isolate just protein. It's like animal proteins are also tied in with a lot of saturated fat. Usually the mm. cholesterol aspect, plant proteins, more fiber, um, more micronutrients, I guess, still there. Mm. Um, even the isolates, right? They still have a degree of that, right? Into my plant protein isolates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, yeah. They, for some reason, the, the supplements just have a bit more fiber in it. Yeah, they tend to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, a couple more things I wanted to talk about the, uh, for protein specifically because I feel like uh, mm -hmm. you're hitting on some really great stuff. So you mentioned uh, the um, the studies done on protein between animal and uh, plants. Um, they were done in uh, pigs. Is that the? I might not get the name right here. I think it's like a bunch of letters, but it's like a protein PD digestibility scale, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. PDCAS and DS scores. Yeah. So like, okay. Would, yeah. 
Yeah, I kind of just wanted to ask that just for clarification because I have heard arguments there and people referring back to uh, that scale and mm -hmm. um, being like, oh, well, you know, this shows that uh, all these animal proteins are way better and more bioavailable and such. I never knew that they were studies done on pigs. So that's really interesting uh, from mm -hmm. my perspective to hear. Yeah, I think the uh, the DS score is done on pigs. Okay. Yeah. That's... um. Yeah, that's really interesting here because I, I have heard that argument so many times and it's like, I feel like you hear it less lately. Um, I think it's not really, it, it I don't hear it talked about too much, but. Yeah, like I said, it, it they were done, they were done to basically figure out what is the minimum essential amino acid content that humans can get away with consuming to be, mm -hmm. to be prevent deficiency. Um, and it only okay. really matters when we're looking at areas of starvation and scarce and food mm -hmm. scarcity. It doesn't really mm -hmm. matter. Like it becomes less of an issue when we're looking at eat high protein intakes. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Professor Stuart Phillips, um, but he's a mm -hmm. he's, he's someone big in the protein world who does a lot of kind of research into protein digestibility and kind of a, you know especially protein for muscle building things like that. Um, and he's mm -hmm. come around to the fact that actually, you know, he previously believed that yeah, animal proteins were superior to plant proteins in every way. But he's almost he's come around to the fact that actually when you when you have higher intakes of plant protein this kind of difference just completely mm. disappears and the ds and the pcas scores just don't really make a difference at that level because mm -hmm. you're getting all the essential mm -hmm. amino acids you need and you're eating enough that what you're absorbing any everything you need to prevent deficiency and actually not just prevent deficiency but you're eating enough to actually make the gains you need to make as well when it comes to muscle building sure yeah. yeah, I know. I, I read a study uh, not too long ago about um, wheat protein versus whey, I think it was. Mm. And uh, at a certain level, like a lower, I think it was like 20 grams or something each, um, mm. the wheat protein, because it's lower in things like leucine and such, yeah, had a yeah. lower MPS response, muscle protein synthesis mm. response, as mm. opposed to when they, you know, they go above and beyond to like 60 grams or something. And both yeah. the, uh, the whey and the wheat uh, had pretty much maximal MPS responses. That, yeah. So yeah, that's that goes to show exactly what you're saying there that like as long as you get a lot of it you're going to get what you want in terms of mm. uh maximal muscle protein synthesis to get those gains <laughs> yeah and lu leucine's uh we know is the limiting one when it comes to uh activating muscle protein synthesis so i think yeah i think as long as people are cognizant about their leucine intake not going too crazy and you don't really have to take mm -hmm. a leucine supplement and things i guess just making mm -hmm. sure that your meal has that one to two grams maybe three grams depending on your body weight of leucine in it um, mm -hmm. you'll be maximally um, triggering muscle protein synthesis at those meals. Um, but, you know, you and I both know that when it comes to muscle building, what matters more is actually the training itself. Like if you're not training mm -hmm. hard in the gym, no, how, no matter how much protein you eat and no matter how much leucine you consume, it's not going to do anything. You're not going to build muscle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, your body will have no reason to build muscle unless you're actually yeah. putting it through that resistance training and training in a way that actually triggers the muscle protein synthesis in the first place. So I guess people worry too much about the intricacies of all of this and the mechanisms, but get forget, completely, completely forget um, looking mm. at the whole picture, which is, are you training hard enough? Are you eating enough calories? Are you sleeping and recovering well? Are you putting in the deloads? Are you preventing injury? You know, who yes. gives a crap how much leucine you're eating if you're not doing any of this other stuff? You know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Like you said, it's like looking at the, the macro picture there. I feel like uh, right off the bat, I just started thinking about um, people, you know, in the, uh, I feel like the carnivore community does this all the time, looking at like mechanistic studies as mm. opposed to like the meta analyses. That was the first mm. thing I just thought about there. It's like, you got to look at the big picture. If they don't believe really in matters. science. They don't believe in the science <laughs> until they find a study that agrees with them. Like that's what I found as yeah. well. Like they'll ignore all well actually they'll think of all nutrition science as rubbish because it focuses on mm. cohort studies which are not mechanistic lab studies but they're like population studies where we look at populations and we look at the way they eat we look at the health outcomes and then we can try and draw conclusions from that based on kind of um you know using statistics kind of to look at what they ate and over time what the outcomes were um mm -hmm. but they don't like that as science unless it agrees with them so the, <laughs> so unless they find a study that agrees with their way of thinking they they will ignore it completely and then the mechanistic stuff is like you know it, it, the maps has seen a tiktok video of one of these guys talking about this this, this so and so was found in rats in mice and i'm like who cares who cares about what they yeah, found yeah. in rats and mice how is that going to apply to us when we know we've got all this yeah. human data that shows what happens in humans it's just yeah it's just amazing watching their mind work but it's dangerous as well in a way what yeah. they're doing exactly yeah it's like yeah. like you said it's like you got to look at if there's human trials you want to look at that <laughs> mm. um, yeah if there's, if there's no human but, trials uh, then at least look at the human data from cohort studies because that's the next best best thing we've got really 
Exactly. Yeah. Um, so uh, we've been talking about protein for a bit. I want to close out one last thing here um, mm-hmm. that you kind of touched on a little bit, I feel like. Um, mm-hmm. Are there any points where you feel like um, someone following a plant-based diet might need to worry about their protein intake being, I don't know, w- what would the threshold be, you think, for protein intake uh, for someone on a plant-based diet versus animal protein? And is there any differences in terms of let's say how lean someone gets or maybe the age or something where they should think about increasing their protein, especially on a plant-based diet. Yeah. There's a lot of kind of conf- not conflicting, but there's a lot of debate over this on like, you know, whether we should be aiming for more protein, whether we should be eating less. Cause some people worry about high protein diets being linked to maybe cancer and things like that as well. I mean, it's mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that research is kind of new and kind of, you know, I'm not too sure about it yet. Um, from what I know, um, for muscle building, we should be aiming between 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram. I think at 1.6, it kind of plateaus off and there's not much difference. Um, mm-hmm. So as long as, you're, as long as you're aiming for that 1.6 grams per kilo body weight um, for muscle building, that's, that's that's you're right on the money there. For people that are a bit leaner, um, I guess if you're lean and eating in a calorie deficit, then you might need to eat a bit more protein because I think you know mm-hmm. when you're in a calorie deficit, your body's going to be drawing on whatever it can for energy sources. And if you're if you're eating kind of slightly less protein then maybe it be start it might start drawing on the muscle as a source of energy because uh, we don't mm-hmm. actually store protein um the only kind of stores we have is in our bones and in our muscle so if you're if you're in a calorie deficit and you're eating less protein then you, your body might want to might start sacrificing some of the muscle in the bone um so yeah i bump it up to about 1.8 to 2 grams per kilo then personally and that's and that's what i've seen mm-hmm. works for people um especially when they're dieting especially for me as well when i was dieting down i increase that protein take a bit further um, but you know, when I'm in muscle building and I'm in a calorie surplus, I can drop that back down to about 1.6 and even get away with a bit less as well. Sometimes, mm-hmm. um, in terms of kind of, as we age, you're right. Um, as kind of, as we age, we naturally elderly people go through something called something called sarcopenia, uh, which mm-hmm. is basically the natural breakdown of muscle tissue, uh, which just happens as we age. The other thing that happens as you age as well, you get this thing called anabolic resistance, which means you kind of mm-hmm need a bit more protein to trigger muscle protein synthesis. You need a bit more stimulus as well. So that's why we encourage people to do resistance training. And as they age, you know, it becomes more important as well to hold on to that muscle uh, because the more muscle you kind of do hold on to, obviously to a point, I'm not asking elderly people to become bodybuilders, but having that muscle keeps you functional, prevents you from falling. And we know falling is a huge risk factor for things like hip fractures, which, you know, if you have a hip fracture, you've got a huge chance of dying in the, in the one year after that. So to prevent that, we want people to stay, um, you know, we want people to stay mobile. We want people to stay functional. We want people to stay strong. So for elderly people, it may be beneficial to eat a bit more protein as well, about maybe 1.4 grams per kilo, 1.3 grams per kilo, depending. Um, if you're someone that's completely sedentary, not doing anything, um, kind of the, the WHO kind of recommends 0.8 grams per kilo, which I think is kind of low. I think that's the kind of bare minimum to prevent deficiency. So I tell people, you know, if, you, if you're not that active, you're not trying to build muscle, then aiming for about one gram per kilogram minimum is probably what we should aim for. And then that mm-hmm. figure can increase depending on your age or depending on your requirements from exercise and your activity level. So, you know, long distance athletes might want to get a bit more, 1.2 grams per kilo. But yeah, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a lot of calculations. People think it's a lot of calculations. I'm not sitting there every day working out how much I'm eating anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, but as long as you kind of have a rough idea, this is how much I should be aiming for, and then look at the foods that will help you reach those. That's the main thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't tell people to count what they're eating, but at least get a serving, like a fist size po- serving of a good plant protein source per meal. You know, be, whether it be a protein powder, whether it be tofu, tempeh, seitan, um, you know, beans, I th- I'd say a secondary protein source. So they're a good source of protein, mm-hmm. but also f- fiber and carbohydrates. So I wouldn't lean on those solely for protein. Mm-hmm. Um, I tend to tell people to try to focus on the tofu, te- tempeh and seitan um, mm-hmm. to get to get that higher protein intake. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, agreed. Uh, as much as I love, love legumes, and I wish that they're absolutely protein packed, they're just yeah. they're they're you know per if you're measuring it based on calories, they're a yeah. little overhyped as a sole protein source. Same with things yeah. like peanut butter and such. They're packaged with oh, the yeah. carbs and the fat there. <laughs> I mean, I, I, every time I eat some peanut butter, I'm like, I wish this was pure protein. Like it's just so good, right? You can literally eat a spoonful I, of it. Um, but yeah, yeah, if you if you, if when you're when you're dieting and you have to measure that peanut butter, things get really real, don't they? Like you, oh you my get god, hum- yeah, it's. It, it humbles you. <laughs> You're like, yeah. this small spoonful is a lot of protein, a lot of uh, calories, yeah. sorry. 
You know what else kills me? When people say quinoa is a protein, a, a great portrait, uh, protein source. I don't grain. know where that came from. It's a good I grain. I don't even I mean, know. But... It's higher in protein than other grains. That's why. So if you want to, you know, if you mix, if you swap out your rice for quinoa, you get a bit more fiber and you get a bit more protein. I think over time, that might be beneficial if you're someone that eats a lot of rice. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, quinoa for me, is it, I always think of it as, like, again, a secondary protein source. It's like ranks below beans and thing, be, below beans and nuts yeah. in terms of protein. Um, yeah. But yeah, for me, as I said before, tofu, tempeh, and all those are at the top. Yeah, that's that's great yeah. advice. Um, I think you touched on some really, really useful stuff there. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about for a little bit is the mm. idea of uh, meat and masculinity. I feel like it's a pretty mm. good segue here from the whole protein section. Mm. Um, and kind of from what we talked about earlier regarding like the ethics and the cognitive uh, dissonance and such there. Mm. Um, what do you think uh, makes um, men so resistant to cutting out meat specifically, um, mm. if you had to give a couple of reasons there? I think it's just so in- ingrained in our in our society, like in culture, right? Like, um, this isn't something that's been going for th- thousands of years, I guess. Like, traditionally, meat has always been thought of this kind of prize that men would go out and hunt for. And, you know, it's it's kind of been associated with, like, virility and masculinity and power and strength and domination. And all these kind of things are thought to be masculine mm-hmm. traits, right? So, and I think, you know, if you're fed that in the media, you're kind of fed this, aren't you? You're fed, not just from media, from your family members as well, I guess. Like, the men in your family would have fed you this idea that meat is manly obviously growing up as men we we buy into the idea right we want to appear we want to appear like masculine to our peers to women like it's there's something primal in us that urges us to behave that way i think for for many of us not for everybody but for Mm -hmm. for many of us Mm -hmm. and i think that that then driven is been driven by this whole media kind of hyping up that meat meat is associated with masculinity like everywhere you look when you know certain ad- adverts for burgers and stuff they'll it'll come up a massive burger comes up and like for men like you know it's it's completely it's in your face all the time and then obviously that's what you associate with it over time right and then um you know when whenever it's depicted in uh, in shows as well like you know every time i've seen someone at like a barbecue the chef is this it's like big manly guy throwing a big meat on the fire it's just kind of constantly in your face and i think that is in, then becomes ingrained in you to think that way um that's one aspect of it um Mm -hmm. there's another really more interesting more sinister more systemic kind of aspect to it as well um i don't know if you've ever read uh this book by carol adams called uh the sexual politics of meat have you ever heard of it so she was a um she's a pretty uh she's a pretty like kind of strong feminist uh and vegan as well activist um and she wrote this book which kind of looks at the intersection between veganism and feminism uh, which people might mm-hmm. think, what? Like, why? How is veganism and feminism linked? Um, it's really interesting because, like, she shows like how, you know, society kind of in the West has been well, society everywhere has been kind of a patriarchal society, right? Men have always kind of been traditionally on top, and everything below men has been kind of dominated by us. Like, men have con- mm-hmm. dominated not just women, but dominated like inferior races, races that they thought were inferior through slavery and uh, you know genocide and things like that they they've um actually i should say white men really unfortunately it's been, that's that's how it's been right throughout history it, it was white men that were doing that but in other societies yeah. as well it would have been the men that were doing that um but they also would dominate animals you know animals are also dominated and uh, kind of um, objectified and 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 she calls talks about this thing about objectification and fragmentation as well like where you do the same thing that you would do to women to animals in a way um like you treat them as objects you kind of mm. fragment them as well like you cut them up into bodies like you refer to women as kind of their breasts and their legs and you do the same thing to animals kind of like to, and, and it's really interesting this book goes into the real depth on that um and i think that kind of people people don't really think about it people don't really think about this how the patriarchy has probably affected the way we view meat um mm. and how how a dominant culture has has also dominated not just human beings but also animals um and then because that's just been the way it's been for so many years that we're still feeling the the effects of that today um and not only that men who would dare to oppose that so men like us who would dare to then go vegan we're kind of um we're humiliated we're called sissies we're called soy boys right there's that kind of homophobic uh you know kind of misogynistic language used you know we're compared to women in a way as well right like you're girly for eating uh, vegetables, you know, 
this kind of thing like that that kind of language evolved from this system of patriarchy which people don't really think about like what you know but it's there right and and once you once you talk about it people think you're being absolutely absurd or crazy until they also then start thinking about it themselves and think actually you're right like you know you've, you've probably been called a soy boy before or a sissy or something like it's happened to you right like it's happened to me as well the moment i gave up eating yeah. meat it was the male members of my family and the, my friends that were guys that were the most mm-hmm. kind of laughed at it the most or thought it was weird or whatever um whereas the women were more kind of accepting of it um mm-hmm. that's one aspect of it the other aspect is i think as well as another trait is empathy men tend to be less empathetic i think than women i think is tra- mm-hmm. traditionally an empathetic empathy is a is a feminine trait right um and to kind of care about animals and to care about the environment you have to have certain levels of empathy which i think mm-hmm. men tend to kind of suppress um whereas and, and women kind of are encouraged to um, be more empathetic in a way just by society mm-hmm. as well so i think yeah it's 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 quite a it's an interesting topic the whole meat masculinity thing like whilst it's been a tradi- traditionally the, been the way and it's like systemic as well um mm-hmm. you know and it's upheld by the media i think and people like us need to kind of have broken free of that mold and we need to kind of show people actually you know you can be manly and and, and not eat meat um yeah and actually in a way there's been a whole campaign of um showing that real men eat plants and you know there's a whole book called eat meat is for pussies um which <laughs> you know you've had game changers as well which shows that you can be uh-huh. like really strong and man it's, you know it's aimed almost at men right um mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> even touched on the fact that uh if you if you eat a meat based diet you increase your risk of uh, heart disease and also uh, erectile dysfunction funny enough yeah. <laughs> so if you really want to be manly you should eat more plants um yeah. so people, yeah people uh, people hated that too people hated yeah, yeah. hearing that they hated hearing it, but it's true. Like, you know, most of the patients I see with erectile dysfunction is because they've got cardiovascular disease. That's the biggest, yep. the most uh, most common cause of erectile dysfunction. Um, yeah, that's because, one of the first things to go there because those, yeah. you know, those uh, veins and everything the, flow, flow into those yeah, the, uh, they, nether regions. It doesn't get the <laughs> blood flow anymore. <laughs> blood flow, yeah, that's how I explain it. I'm like, I literally explain it like that. I'm like, you know, the blood flow to the heart is, is constricted, but also the blood flow to other areas, such as the penis, <laughs> it's, it's also restricted. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it's it's just it's very interesting about how we've been kind of conditioned to think that meat is masculine, but when you start tearing apart the little things that hold this idea together, um, it has no leg to stand on, really. And you know, mm-hmm. it, it's we're here to dismantle that completely. Mm-hmm. Um, first of all, what you said about um, that book that you referenced. Mm. That blew my mind. I have been vegan for seven years, vegetarian for four before that, mm. and I never once heard that. Uh, so that really blew my mind there. <laughs> yeah, I think I would encourage everyone to read that book, The Sexual Politics of yeah. Me by Carol Adams. I already um, I already wrote it down. Um, yeah. I'm definitely going to be reading that one. Uh, that sounds really interesting. I never heard that argument. I don't know how. Um, mm. That's really interesting, though. Mm. Um, and then in terms of... Uh, a vegan diet being, uh, you know, like this backlash now with, uh, you know, like more fit, muscular slash manly, you know, stereotypically manly men uh, eating plant based and promoting a plant based diet. You know, we have uh, we have examples like first one pops in my head, Patrick Baboumian, the mm. jacked, um, you know, just fucking uh, behemoth of a man who competed mm. strongman for years. You know, he wrote a book called The Vegan Badass, right? I think it was yeah. a book or he had a brand or something. I think he um, did write a book as well. I think he wrote a book as well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, you see a lot of these uh, other vegan lifters. There's, it's such a niche um, thing, first of all. Like, uh, you know, there's, what, I don't know if the percentages change here, but it's like one percentage of the whole population is maybe vegan in the whole world. Like yeah. One, I don't know. Too, yeah. What, what have you heard there? Yeah, that yeah. one, one and a half percent, yeah. It's tiny. Yeah. I mean, you have to take into account things like um, who is going vegan here. But it's mind blowing that you're still seeing really successful vegan athletes, I mean, plant based athletes, you know, and people still talk shit being like, you know, vegans can't get muscular, they're all skinny, they're not mm-hmm. good at sports, they're not athletic. And you consider how low the population density is that's actually vegan and mm-hmm. the amount of amazing athletes there. It's really pretty crazy if you think Novak about it. Is, uh, Novak Djokovic is plant based, isn't he? He never says he's vegan, but I think yeah. he's fully plant based in terms of his diet. And he's at top one percent of tennis players of all time like he's yeah. incredible right and then you got um i guess lewis hamilton um you know uh formula one racing people don't think of it as like an athletic endeavor but 
you have to be your brain has to be super switched on when you go get that speed and he's been vegan mm-hmm. for years as well um i think the venus uh, the williams sisters as well they went plant-based for health reasons venus definitely went plant-based for health reasons i don't know if serena did mm-hmm. but um they're right they're at the top of the game you've got you've got olympic uh, athletes as well that do it it's yeah it's everywhere now um so people definitely yeah. breaking the mold i mean i mean you've got a uh, long distance runners as well like scott jurek um fiona oaks fiona oaks actually mm-hmm. has set multiple uh, world records in marathon running scott jurek has set records as well in uh, long distance ultra marathon running uh people like rich mm-hmm. roll who uh yeah. went vegan in his like 50s or something went plant-based in like 50s and ended up taking yeah. up running then so like it's just yeah it's just it, it they have, yeah, there's no argument there to be made that you, know, yeah. you can't be a successful athlete on a plant-based diet when so many are doing it now, which is, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, there's, uh, there's like, I, the Game Changers talked about this. There was like a, I don't know if they're still doing it, but there was like a mm. full um, American football team who was basically all vegan, all, all plant-based, right? Yeah, I think a lot of their players went plant-based, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It yeah wasn't, I think it was a whole team. Crazy. There's a team in uh, the th- UK <laughs> that's uh, a completely vegan football team. No, sorry. It's uh-huh. a completely vegan rugby team, and there's a f- okay. there's a football or soccer team that um, only serves vegan food at their ground, and I think a lot of the mm. players are also plant based. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, we're seeing some crazy examples considering how few vegans there really are in the world, strict vegans. Yeah. Um, and then also you you take you know physique sports, you take uh, strength based sports. You know, there's Kendrick Ferris, uh, the Olympic weightlifter. Um, yeah. You got like a ton of vegan bodybuilders, you know, they, yeah. they're just, they're everywhere. I feel like, yeah. um, vegan powerlifters, there's, uh, um, Marco Galindo Jr. Uh, I follow him on Instagram. Oh my he God. Just squatted. Like he squatted yeah, 700 pounds. Saw, just saw recently. That, yeah. Yeah. There's a, just there's a, insane. there's a female powerlifter in the UK, uh, Sophia Ellis. She's like set a European record in the deadlift. She's fully vegan. It's crazy. Yeah. Like I've met her. She's amazing. Like, yeah, yeah there's uh, it, and there's still people who just, uh, they, they either don't know still or they're just turning a blind eye to it mm. uh, because you just cannot make the argument that uh, if you're vegan, you can't be an amazing athlete at this point. It just, there's no, yeah. there's no leg to stand on there. Like you said, no, it's, it's just fear. I think it's just fear mongering from people that, um, you know, it's just social media. This is, it's, it's incredibly amazing that you get, can see all these amazing people, you know, we connected through social media as well, but at the same yeah. time, it's incredibly toxic with the kind of, misinformation sure. that's there and the anti-vegan propaganda that's there as well and i'm i'm not sure where it's coming from i'm not sure i think are people afraid that we're coming to take their meat away or something like is that is that <laughs> the fear that they're afraid that society is at the at this crossroads where you know it's almost um things are going to change now like things are and this, and are these people scared are they, do they do they know that they sense that the tide is turning and for years uh, this was kind of like a veganism was this niche thing right there was hardly anyone out there like i remember when i went vegan five years ago which is not even that long ago there's barely any meat alternatives and and forget trying to find mm-hmm. any vegan cheese or anything like that um but since then it's been like an explosion like 2019 2020 uh, just before covid actually 2019 was like an explosion i think for veganism mm-hmm. and since it then was. it's just continued to grow right um and i think now we're seeing kind of backlash against that from big meat industries big um big dairy industries but also these kind of online social media influencer types um who yes, who are probably sure. scared that they're not gonna get to uh you know eat meat the way they're doing it because they can't ignore that what they're doing is destroying the environment not only is it incredibly mm. kind of unethical when you look at kind of just animal suffering standpoint but the environmental impact of what they're doing and what they're proposing that others do as well it's just mm-hmm. it's just mind-boggling so i think yeah we're seeing a lot more strong fight back from these people because of how well i guess the movement is doing yeah yeah like you kind of mentioned uh you know the the carnivore backlash feels like it's very tied in with against veganism you know it's like the the Mm. pure antithesis of uh of veganism i would say and um it does feel like a backlash there and uh to kind of segue into one more thing you you um you kind of talked about um uh mentioning in this podcast was just the pressure on um vegans to be good examples um Mm. i think that'd be an interesting thing to kind of touch on really quick because it's like you know like i said um there there still is a stereotype of vegans being skinny you know um very unhealthy or like lacking in certain nutrients or something and i definitely feel myself uh being like you know trying to portray myself as a fit healthy vegan that there is pressure there um how do you do you feel that on your end too I, i would imagine 
Yeah, for sure. Like, for sure. Like, I mean, when people ask, I think, so like at work, I don't tend to mention I'm vegan straight off the bat, but like, you know, if someone asks, uh-huh. I'll say I'm vegan. And the first reaction is, what? Like, they couldn't, they can't believe it. I'm like, why, why can't you believe it? They're like, well, because you have muscle. Like, you don't look like a vegan. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what's a vegan supposed to look like? like? They all have this kind of, in their mind, this, again, this is the media. The media's portrayal of veganism has always been kind of this skinny, um, kind of hippie type, um, you know, tired, <laughs> deficient, all these yeah. kind of things. And this is the this is the media portrayal of veganism. Like, there's this interesting study that looked at, um, I think it was like 300 articles or more. I can't remember exact, the exact mm-hmm. number. Um, but looked at all these articles in the UK from tabloids and I think 70% or something like that when they mentioned veganism was in a negative light so when you've got mm. negativity being portrayed on, on veganism all the time that's what people are going to think about it right um, you know when, this is another example um, whenever there's been a tragic case of like uh, a child being neglected by their parents and not fed properly mm. the first thing I'll see is uh, parents feed child vegan diet I'm like that's not what that's not what killed the kid they fed him like a diet yeah. of just oat milk and nothing else like they were yeah. neglectful because they were neglectful and you and you know you're not going to get the same article when um someone that's an omnivore feeds a child uh, you know standard diet but also neglects them you're not gonna get omnivore kills a uh, child it's like that focus on veganism is what the media tends to do and I think yeah mm-hmm. we that then pressurizes us as vegans to you know, not only maintain our uh, health and fitness just for our own sake anyway, um, but you almost outwardly portray yourself as someone that is more fit and healthy and there's this added kind of pressure from people wa- waiting f- waiting for you to mess up almost. Like, yeah. you know the carnival community are waiting for more of us to, like, mess up because every now and then mm. you'll get, like, this ex-vegan who did the vegan diet but, I don't know, did it kind of wrong or fell sick for whatever reason. Like, there was a guy who did, like, mm-hmm. a water fast for 30 days Um and and then end up drinking his own urine as well as part of the fast. I don't know what he was doing, but he was like a like a oh, quite yeah. famous vegan influencer. And oh, that was uh, Dorian Ryder, wasn't it? Pardon? He was. Was that Dorian Ryder? Nah, nah. It was a, it was a British guy. Oh. I don't want to say his name. I'm not going to say his name. I'm not going to mention him. But like he he oh, yeah. um, <laughs> he he was quite fit and healthy actually. He used to do a lot of free running and all sorts. He used to do, um, uh, you know that American warrior kind of when you go for all these um, um obstacle courses. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He was I do really remember good. this guy. He was a free runner. Like, he did parkour and all sorts. He did this. He was really, like, really in shape. And he was actually a brand mm-hmm. ambassador for, like, a, a, com- a company as well. Um, but then he went on, like, he, he, I don't know what happened. I don't know whether it was mental health or what. Like, I, I don't want to pretend mm-hmm. to know exactly what was going on in his life. But yeah. his health deteriorated. And he blamed veganism on it. And then came out of this ex-vegan. And I've seen other people mm-hmm. do this too. And I'm like, you know... If this was a thing, then I would not know vegans that have been vegan for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Like, I'm literally meeting these mm-hmm. people when I go to, like, vegan festivals and when I do my talks and stuff. I'm talking to... You know, I met a guy who's 90 years old and he took up running in his 70s, you know? And he's running ultras That's now. Amazing. It's it's crazy. He's, like, n- almost 90 and he's Incredible. running ultra marathons. Or he, like, walks some of it as well. But, yeah, he went vegan in yeah. his, like, 40s or something. So he's been vegan for a good 40 years. Um, wow. why isn't he suffering from deficiencies and becoming sick and all this stuff why is he able to I mean these are all just individual examples which I tend not to care about too much because it's just individuals and we look at kind of mm-hmm. totality of evidence right um, and I've, I guess I've gone on topic a little bit here as well but yeah, <laughs> this pressure on us to kind of portray ourselves that way is because of this right that people are waiting for us to mess up um, mm-hmm. and yeah there's that added pressure there but I think you know for you and I we do it for ourselves as well like we want to we want to um we want to look good. We want to feel good. We want to. We want to, you know, continue to make uh, make gains in the gym for as long as we can. Um, but there definitely is that added pressure that we feel from from people just waiting for us to mess up. I feel, um, or because we yeah. want to also present veganism as as being better than the alternative, uh, in a yeah. way, which for many reasons it is. Um, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, there's the whole uh, stereotype of the militant vegan that's still uh, a thing, but I think it's yeah. just, I'm, you know, we're also passionate about it and we want the it's world passion. to go vegan, obviously. Yeah, yeah. it's a passion. Um, and uh, it's hard to, to kind of toe that line between uh, really wanting to get the, your message out there and wanting people to eat more plant based and sounding, you know, overly pushy. Um, so it's a, it's a tricky line there. <laughs> mm. Yeah, for sure. I think. Yeah, we. I think you and I both tread that quite well because uh, we use a bit of humor as well. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, people are gonna do activism in in different ways, and people are. 
emotion i think veganism is quite an emotional thing as well because we're not just it's not like it's not like just the environment where you know i mean even the environment can be quite kind of quite distressing quite emotional thing to talk about for some people actually when you look at the mm-hmm. consequences on people but i think with the veganism for most we- vegans we know there's a there's a there's a victim at the end of this at the end of all this and that's the individual animal and yeah. whilst we say there's 80 billion land animals being killed per year you know um something like two trillion tr- fish as well being killed per year and then not to right, mention all right. the other animals because of bycatch we these these are just numbers for people but for us we know that's an individual sentient being and then anyone has been able to connect with an animal uh, be it a pet or even being at a sanctuary or going to any of these vigils and stuff where you see the animal there is this huge emotional connection there that we feel um and we know we know that these animals are suffering in that way and if you take that the weight of that um suffering onto us because we're empathizing like you know we didn't become vegan because we don't have empathy we of course we have empathy um and that i think then channels into this emotion which if you project it outwards uh in certain ways can come across as i guess militant or extreme or whatever because people aren't used to it people Mm -hmm. people aren't on the same wavelength of thinking as we are they're not thinking about the suffering they're thinking about Mm -hmm. food they're thinking about this they're associating what's on their plate with food right whereas we're associating what's on the plate with the actual animal we've made that connection and i think once you've made that connection it's hard to kind of go back from that and we can't we it's almost like you have to kind of try and rewire your brain into thinking how a non-vegan thinks about what they're doing right which is so difficult once you especially the longer you've been in this right um so yeah and and it's it's going to be two sides that aren't looking at the same picture every time that trying to communicate when we're trying to communicate with Mm -hmm. non-vegans both of us are looking at something completely different when we look at plate plate of um of of meat we're looking at an animal every single time and i think that's why people that aren't vegan view us as more emotional and militant and extreme whereas we view Mm -hmm. ourselves as you, you know i think we're trying to fight for something we think is right or we 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 know within us is right um yeah whereas people view us as self-righteous i guess which is another yeah, whole yeah. story of how people view us and and there's a whole other topic of why people tear down veganism and how it's actually to make themselves also feel better in, in ways as well and they may not even consciously realize that they're doing that um mm-hmm. but yeah it's it's yeah certainly a really interesting kind of area of, uh, of to think about yeah, and there's all different ways of handling the, uh, you know, the your personal your personal approach to activism versus like feeling what your viewers will find, um, you know, an appealing way to kind of bring it about. Um, mm. Like you know, I, going back to what you said about your your ex, um, the way that she sounds like she approached it with you actually mm. sounded like a great approach. You know, it was like subtle mm. enough where it wasn't like in your face, like hey, you need yeah. to do this because people don't tend to respond well with being mm. told specifically what to do. You know. Yeah, definitely. No one, no one likes being told what to do. You know, you switch off straight away, right? You go to defense mode, and if you tell anybody what they're doing is horrible or wrong, and you and you attack them, um, they'll they'll become defensive. And as soon as you become defensive, yeah. you switch yourself off to being being even uh, approached in a kind of way that might make you change your mind. You you don't want to hear the argument, and then you'll associate mm-hmm. every single interaction with a vegan thereafter with that interaction you had with this vegan, and that's where people yeah. get kind of lumped into this. Uh, lumped into the same thing like you know everyone gets judged for the actions of one person um yeah and then you know there's been whole again there's been whole freaking articles on, on the things like this where people have wrote about how you shouldn't really um you know judge the message by the messenger you know the message mm-hmm. is still the mm-hmm. same yeah. right the message is what carries the weight don't judge it by the messenger uh, which is what yeah. people tend to do yeah that's a great point um so i know that we are getting a little getting a little long here um, so I, I don't I want to be, uh, I don't want to take you too long. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, yeah. so I'd like to kind of end on something that's a little more of like a positive note, a uh, little, you know, little bit of extra tips for people. Um, mm-hmm. if someone is interested in going uh, vegan, um, and they are an athlete for instance, um, what do you think are, is a great way to kind of approach that? And do you have any, uh, other sources you could suggest or anything to help them do that? Yeah. Um, so I think it depends where they're starting from as well. So if they're coming from an omnivorous, traditionally an omnivorous diet, they may they may yeah. have to kind of like look at the diet and think, okay, where can I make the switches? Um, and there's two approaches. Like I went vegan overnight and I had to kind of plan everything there and then because there's no way I was going to go back yeah. to eating the way I was eating, right? 
Um, so it really depends on the person. So if they're going to go into it with a with a kind of a long kind of a long goal approach where they you know the end goal end goal is to go vegan, but they might not necessarily want to do it overnight because it's difficult for them to plan it and they're scared of kind of mm -hmm. all these things. I would say just switch out one meal at a time. Um, and that's what actually worked for one of my friends. He kind of switched out one meal at a time and pretty much at one point he kind of dropped all eggs from his diet and then from the next day he was technically a dietary vegan um, and then the mm -hmm. rest of it will come after that kind of the lifestyle thing. So I think doing your research first and looking at kind of, okay, what foods can I put in that are good swaps? So like swapping out, like mm -hmm. let's say, um, if, you're, if you're someone that likes eating scrambled eggs, swapping, swapping out for scrambled tofu. So learn a good scrambled tofu recipe and you can make that. Learn how much tofu you'll mm -hmm. need to get the same amount of protein. There you go, you switched out that meal straight away. Okay, let's say you like having, um, you like having, I don't know, you like having steaks. <laughs> I don't know, you, 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 can, you can try and figure out like how much tempeh or how much seitan do you need to get that equivalent of protein and then either learn how to mm -hmm. make seitan or you can buy it ready made. Um, also using kind of these, um, you know, meat, plant-based meat alternatives are a great kind of segue as well and kind of really good for transitioning vegans. So finding one that has um, the right kind of macros that you're looking at. So I tend to go for ones that have more protein per calorie um, just because I don't want, I want to try and ignore the ones that have a lot of filler, like the lot added fats and the added carbs that I don't really want. I try to go mm -hmm. for those. Um, and I, I would encourage people to do that too if they're trying to swap like for like. That's kind of what I did at the start as well. I kind of went for like plant-based sausages, plant-based burgers and things like that and switched them out. And that really kind of helped me um, maintain the protein I was eating whilst at the same time I was doing research on, okay, what other foods I can eat. So that might be something yeah. that people want to consider. And then you can either do it meal by meal, as I said, or if you if you really if you really want to just go in, all in and do it, do it all in one go, you can. But just mm -hmm. know that you more people fail doing that than, than doing it the long way. Um, sure. So yeah, that's what I would say when it comes to kind of planning out your, your meals. There was another question at the end yeah. of that, I think you said. I'm trying to remember. Just that. like any other, any sources or oh, let's say sources. Like books yeah, yeah, or yeah. Uh, resources online or anything. There's, yeah. um, there's a book called Plant-Based Athlete by uh, Robert Cheek mm -hmm. and I think Matt Frazier. Have you heard of it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh -huh. that's, that's actually, um, I've been talking to Robert about coming on the podcast. Uh, he's supposed to come on in next month. Amazing, so yeah, we'll Robert see. Cheek, he's great. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's a legend, fun. dude. Yeah, yeah, he is. <laughs> he is. He's definitely a legend. So, um, yeah, his book is really good, actually. Um, reading through it, I kind of, yeah, it's it's pretty much a blueprint on how to set up a diet for for a plant based athlete. Um, it's, it's great. It's got you know all the protein sources. It's got the reasons why you should do it. It's got examples of mm -hmm. all the athletes, but then it's also got like okay breakdown of what foods you should kind of focus on. Mm -hmm. um, what proteins what foods are high in protein in plants and what f and how you should be eating carbohydrates you know skipping carbohydrates isn't going to be good for you if you're um mm -hmm. someone who actually cares about your performance like low carb diets may work for some people but yeah. more often than not athletes will find that going a low, car low carb diet their uh, performance actually suffers because you know as you and i both know that you need carbohydrates as a store and we store them as glycogen in our muscles and our liver yeah. Um, but actually when we use our muscles, um, we're using that glycogen, uh, especially when we're doing a um, strength based exercise. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think that, that book is great. Um, they've got an associate cookbook as well. I think, uh, Matt Frazier's okay. got his own book on plant-based athletes as well. Um, and I really like any resources by, you know, Simon Hill. No, um, I've never heard of him. So he has a podcast called the proof, but he also got, he has a book called, um, the proof is in the plants. Um, mm -hmm. that's a good book, I think, just for anyone looking to level up their health on a plant-based diet. Um, yeah, he, 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 he had a podcast called the, the plant proof podcast, and then he kind of changed it to the proof cause he's made it more about kind of all science rather than just plant-based, but he is still, plant, okay. he's still, he's still plant-based vegan. Um, and a lot of his early episodes on his podcast was about veganism and plant-based diets, but now he's kind of shifted to holistically looking at, um, all diets except for carnivore he's usually on social media tearing down the carnivore diet which is kind of cool but um his book is pretty good um i, I would encourage you okay. to give that read so yeah okay that's that's great advice um i love that and um for anything to sort of close out do you have anything you want to kind of leave people off on here you feel like we pretty much covered everything yeah i think we pretty much covered everything i think uh, yeah i think people people should definitely look at the reasons for going vegan and uh, not be afraid of kind of what they're going to be missing out on and actually look at it from uh, the way that I look at it now is like you have so much more to gain from going vegan mm -hmm. um, in the sense that you're going to be introduced to so many new foods um, you're going to be introduced to a whole new way of eating which is going to be healthier for you the planet and better for the animals as well so 
yeah, I encourage anyone to kind of give it a try. Um, and there's loads of ways to do it slowly. There's a ways to, you know, if you want to jump in in the deep end and do it quick, then you can do that as well. But know that there's so many resources online that you can lead on as well. Um, you know. Yeah. So yeah. This is uh, the internet. The internet is a great thing. Uh, everything is online nowadays. <laughs> Literally everything is there. So you you, you know in. in and if if you know any vegans, or if you you know if you, if you want to just message anyone online, you can message me online as well. Like we're we're more than happy to help and point you in the right direction as well. So that's the one thing mm-hmm. I do love about veganism as well is the community. Like I think there's a whole yeah. community feel to where people definitely do help each other and are really helpful towards one another. Um, and For people sure. that are kind of looking to become vegan as well, we're more than happy to help mm-hmm. people do that too. Yeah, the the vegan community is amazing. Uh, absolutely love the people in this community because you know everyone's very empathetic and such. Um, yeah. Where can people find you on social media? So uh, my my um, social media tag is Doctor Iron Junkie. Um, okay. Yeah, I made that when I was like seventeen because I was addicted to the iron. Obviously, um, it's, it's you just, now, dude. It's, it's who stuck. you are. It's just stuck now. I, just, <laughs> I, I thought about changing it at one point, but then I was like. It's yeah. too late. It's too late. <laughs> it, it gets it gets too late sometimes. Yeah, it's just like this is who I, this is who I am. I just gotta this go with it. <laughs> keep, you know, my friends will be calling me Doctor Iron Junkie in in real life, and it and I'm just like, yup. <laughs> yeah, so it's, Dude, yeah, my friends call me Tofu Strong all the time in person. I'm like, that's a great God. name. Tofu it's just kind of it's just kind of great. It's great. Yeah, Mine has nothing to do with veganism. It, but... Mine has nothing. to do with veganism. <laughs> It's just about training, Doctor Iron Junkie. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you like you're so well known as like uh, you know in the community as being a, a vegan lifter. Now I feel like it's just tied together. Plus, like you click your Instagram, it just says vegan right there, doesn't it? So yeah, yeah, it, wor- it works out. It works out. <laughs> All right, man. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, uh, so much for your time. I think this was an amazing conversation, dude. Um, yeah, great chat. And um, yeah, um, I guess let's let's close out here. Um, thank you, and uh, I'll uh, talk to you soon. Yeah. See you, bro. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Athex Approach Podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't already, it would mean a ton if you gave the podcast a follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Radio Public, Pocket Casts, Stitcher, Player FM, Pinecast, or any other service you're listening to it on. And if you subscribe to the Athex Fitness YouTube channel, Instagram page, Twitter, and Facebook page. Feel free to check out the articles, training, and nutrition programs, coaching services, and merch on athixfitness.com. And if you like what I'm making, dropping a like, commenting, and sharing would mean a ton to me. Thank you so much again, and I'll see you in the next episode. Peace out.